is how I would actually go out and take a reading on this piece of equipment. Okay, so very, very important when we go out. We don't realize that because when we're out doing our vibration readings, we're focusing on the piece of equipment. So as I'm walking up to this piece of equipment, I know that there may be a fault with it or whatever, and I'm walking towards this piece of equipment. And what we do is we zero in on the equipment like this, not looking around for any piping, any other sharp edges. A lot of times this pump is down in a hole or it's wherever it may be, up in a really high location or whatever. They're not always sitting there just like this, so they're easy to access, okay? So another thing, when I approach a machine to take a reading, I always approach the machine on a tangent. I never walk up 90 degrees to that coupling or that drive shaft because if something flies off this piece of equipment, it's going to go off in a tangent to this and it's going to fly right straight at me. So when I approach a piece of equipment, I generally approach it at an angle. I never walk right straight into that piece of equipment, okay? Just in case, because when you're going to take a reading, a lot of times you're saying, that piece of equipment is making a lot of noise. So there's something going on. When you're going to take a reading, there's something wrong with this and it could go anytime. You don't really know, okay? So when I go, I'm just gonna go over here and get an accelerometer. So an accelerometer. So what I would do is I'd approach this machine at a tangent from here. I would walk up to the machine and we always label our machine by the transmission of power. So we start at the outboard side of the motor position one. Inboard side of the motor, position two. Inboard side of the pump, position three. Outboard side of the pump, position four. There was a gearbox here, on and on and on. So we take our measurements, one, two, three, four, and then we take measurements in three different directions, vertical and horizontal, which are perpendicular to the shaft, and then axial in line to the shaft. And a lot of times the difference between an axial and a horizontal or a vertical reading can alert you to a problem. If your axial reading is over 50% of what your vertical reading is, then chances are you have misalignment. So that's why we have to take readings in three different directions. And this accelerometer only reads in the direction that the accelerometer is pointed. So when I come up to the machine, my box has come up, I program the root in the box, and I don't know if we have any in here, I'll have a look. Root. Uh, yeah, we do. So here we have our root data in the box. And so each point, here's position 01, M1H, motor, horizontal, position 1, right here. So I come bring that up. And you always, when you're doing this, you make sure you're in the right position. Usually what there'll be is a number on this piece of equipment. The number will come up. So this is 01. So you make sure because a lot of times that equipment is spared or equipment is not running, you skip it. If you don't advance the box, you get to the end of the route and you got three machines left over. Which three did you miss? You got to go back to the start and do the whole route again. So we don't, so you always make sure, check, make sure in the right location, the right machine. And then when I take a reading, this accelerometer is exactly the same as an egg. Okay, this is very, very delicate, sensitive piece of equipment here. And so when I take a reading, first thing I do, the poles I clean off with my hand, make sure they're nice and clean. And then I find a solid location on this piece of equipment to take a reading, okay? You never take a reading off a shroud and that's tinny and vibrates, that'll shake like crazy. So I'm gonna take a reading on this piece of equipment. A lot of times what you can do is go across the veins here. You can also have targets that you could glue in here that you could take a reading. And so I go across the veins. Every time I take a reading, I put the accelerometer on, shake it. So I make sure it's nice and tight, give it time to settle because there's all kinds of electronics here. So when I put this on, I roll it on. I don't, bam, put this on here like that. So very slowly, put it on, give it a shake. One, two, three, four, five, boom, take my reading. Okay, you have to give it time. If you don't let it settle down, then it's going to give you something called a ski slope. And you always know when you have bad data and vibration, because the spectrum will look like a ski slope, or what we call it a ski slope. So it's a piece of chalk here. So here's our spectrum again. If I take a reading that I didn't give it enough settling time, if I didn't uh, slam it on too hard, whatever, then what I'll get is this looks like that. 
and that's called a ski slope. And the reason it's called a ski, the reason that happens is that when you slam the accelerometer on there, everything's shaking around. The box doesn't know where to put the data on the spectrum. Remember I said the spectrum is divided into bins. The more bins there are, the clearer the picture. So the bins are the same as the lines of resolution. So this bin might go from zero to five CPM, from five to 10 CPM, from 10 to 15 CPM, from 15 to 20, all the way along. When you slam the accelerometer on, the box is confused. It doesn't know where to put the data, so it throws it all right into the first bin, right down here. And that's why the ski slope. So as soon as you see a ski slope, you know that you didn't do, you didn't give it the right settling time. First thing you need to delete, get rid of it, because you can go onto the box and ask it to delete the reading. Somewhere here, so I can't remember when, because I'm old, <laughs> but there's actually a way. It'll say, do you want to delete this sensor improperly? So it'll ask you to delete the reading, and you get a bad reading, it'll delete it. Let's see if we can take a reading here and see what the box does. So here, it's just a general picture of a box. It'll give you our different spectrums. It'll give us a waveform. And then it'll actually tell you, if you go to the previous pointer, that it was bad sensor. So the box, like, I didn't have the sensor hooked up. Bad sensor. So it'll tell you not enough settling time or whatever. Or it'll show you that ski slope. As soon as you see the ski slope, delete the data. So once we go in, we delete the data, get rid of it, take another reading, give it the proper settling time. And then, so I take my reading, horizontal reading, or a vertical reading up top, and then an axial reading. So a lot of times the axial reading from the one position and the two position, the reading's gonna be the same. So a lot of times we'll just take an axial reading at the two position. So we'll go one H, one V here, one H, one V, one, or two H, 2V, 2A here, and then once again, over to this piece of equipment, three horizontal, vertical, axial reading here, and then position four in the pump is not out here where the impeller is, but where the bearings are. So we've got two bearings in this pump, inboard bearing, outboard bearing. Next reading will be right on this bearing here. Once again, see how I can rock that around? So I just give it a little bit of a turn. Now it's nice and solid. One, two, three, four, five, boom, take my reading. So basically that's how we take our readings. And we're always kind of aware of our surroundings all the time. Because you don't know, right? You're in a lot of places with piping. I've been down on holes. I've had to crawl through things to take readings. You name it. You've been there, right? A lot of machinery isn't sitting in a nice, convenient location like this. So that's basically, in a nutshell, how we set our box up and then we go take a reading on the box. And so what dictates what type of instrument you use, whether it's a accelerometer like this one, whether we come over here, a velocity transducer like this piece of equipment, or a proximity probe, which we don't have one here, but basically what dictates what instrument you use is what speed you use. So remember, like from zero to 600 CPM, we're always measuring in displacement from 600 CPM to 60,000, we're measuring in velocity. From 60,000 above, we measure in acceleration. So we have a reading between 600 and 60,000, velocity transducer. Above 60,000 CPM, accelerometer. Below that, proximity probe. So our different instruments. So with the accelerometer, what happens inside here is there's a little crystal inside this piece of equipment. And so what all these instruments do is convert that mechanical motion up and down into an electrical signal. And so if we go over here and look at what makes that waveform is the varying of the voltages inside this. So as it shakes, the voltage changes. And so remember, vibration is back and forth movement from the neutral position. Well, put this on, it's at the neutral position. You turn it on, there's a little crystal in here. And as it squeezes, the voltage increases. Then it goes down, doesn't squeeze, the voltage goes down, squeezes, the voltage goes up and back. So it's a little crystal in here called a physioelectric crystal. It's only in the accelerometer. And so basically what happens with that crystal is as it shakes, it squeezes it, varies that electrical signal. So it takes that mechanical motion, turns it into an electrical signal that the box can interpret, and make a waveform. And remember the waveform, then the box does the FFT and changes that into a spectrum on the bottom. So basically 
Physio, when you're talking accelerometer, physioelectric crystal. Physio means squeeze in Greek. That's why, because it squeezes down, okay? There's a shear type, which squeezes. Uh, there, or there's a compression type that squeezes down, and then there's also a shear type that kind of the crystal looks like this with a hole in the middle. Or if you look at it from sideways, it looks like this with a hole through it. And then there's a metal rod that goes through it. The faster the metal rod vibrates, the more signal it makes. And that, so in that case, when we're talking about a uh, velocity transducer, well, this doesn't have a piezoelectric crystal in it. What this has is a magnet inside here with a core, iron core, with a uh, wire wrapped around it, suspended between two springs. So anybody who knows anything about magnetism, inside that magnet iron, iron core, the faster it vibrates, the more voltage it makes, the slower it vibrates, the less voltage it makes. Once again, Box reads this, makes the waveform, and then converts it to the FFT that we can see. Difference with this is these things are super, super sensitive. If I drop this, throw it in the garbage. This one here, you could probably get away with a lot more abuse with this one, okay? Now, the last probe that we use for below 600 RPM or when we're balancing or when we have a friction bearing or, uh, you know, not a, uh, like you're not an any friction bearing, but like a journal bearing or something like that, then we use something called a prox probe. And so what a prox, let's, let's imagine here we have a pillow block bearing, just a plain old friction bearing. And here we got the pillow block split, right? Back and forth, split through here. So while we use at the low speed, what we have is a proximity probe. Proximity probe is the only instrument that needs its own power source. The uh, uh, velocity transducer and the accelerometer are powered up by the instrument or the box. Proximity probe needs its own DC power supply. And so how the prox probe works is what we'll do is generally we'll drill a hole in this housing, thread it, drill a hole over in this housing, thread it, and then we screw a proximity probe in here. The end of the proximity probe, as it goes in here, it goes into the housing, and then the shaft in here, the what happens is we energize this with DC current, and then it has these little, we call them eddy currents that come around the end. Basically, it makes a magnetic field. The closer the journal gets to the magnetic field, the more voltage it makes, the farther away, the less voltage it makes. So it still makes this wave like this, okay? And the thing is, is that why we do this is we have one probe here, we have one probe here, they're 90 degrees apart, the two probes. So they're 90 degrees apart. And then what we can do with that is we can make something called an orbit plot. And so orbit plots are another way that we can analyze equipment. So what it'll do is show the actual motion of the journal inside the bearing housing. So I can see it. If it's off center, it'll show up like this off center. If it's perfectly on center, then it will, but it'll show me. If this is perfectly centered around here, then I know the journal's exactly in the center of that bearing house, which never happens. It's always off a little bit because this is riding on a little cushion of oil, right? So with those probes, also certain shapes in the orbit plot will show you different faults. So if I saw an orbit plot that looked like this, back up like that, misalignment. So different shapes on the orbit plot will show you different things. Okay, so the thing you remember, proximity probe, low speed, usually measuring its displacement or how much it moves. It's the only one that needs its own power supply. Eddy current, closer that gets to it, the more voltage, the less voltage, below 600 RPM. Velocity transducer, we use that between 600 and 60,000 CPM. We're using an iron core that's suspended in a magnet as that thing vibrates that's what generates the surf the accelerometer we're measuring acceleration above 60,000 cpm uses a physioelectric crystal so those are basically our three types of instruments that we use and they're dictated by what speed they run at that's what uh, indicates what instrument we would use accelerometer Okay, and the reason I'm going to tell you, so after I told you all that stuff, now I'm going to throw you the curveball, okay? Because what happens with the box is, in actual fact, we take all the readings with the accelerometer nowadays. And then what the box does is it makes a conversion back. So if it's in, we take a reading, every reading's in acceleration, 
and then the box does a mathematical conversion to, to move it to displacement or to uh, velocity. So the thing is, anytime you do a mathematical conversion on something, you're losing a little bit of accuracy. So if you need extreme accuracy, then you would actually use the, uh, the Prox probe or you might use a velocity transducer. But in actual fact, when I'm out doing 15,000 points a month on all different pieces of equipment at all different speeds and all that, I'm not gonna bring three instruments with me, go out there and change them for every reading and all that stuff. I don't have time to go through all that crap. So what the box does, takes everything with the accelerometer and converts it back. So you lose a little bit of accuracy, but it's good enough because what we're looking for is change. So always change. And one last thing that I forgot is when we take a reading with an accelerometer, the main thing that we take these readings is consistency, consistency, consistency. So we've got to take, it doesn't matter if the reading is perfectly horizontal or perfectly vertical or whatever, because a lot of times we're not able to take it in the perfect location because of something's in the way. So what we do is the first guy that goes and takes a reading puts a mark on the piece of equipment. And so what we'll do is we'll put a circle, put an X through it like that. So the next person that comes knows exactly where you took that reading. We'll take a white marker or something, put a line with an X on it like that. So the next person that comes along goes on there like that, and they know where to take the reading. So we always mark it consistency, consistency, consistency. Same readings from the same locations at the same interval of time between readings, any good program, that's the way you run it.